With three titles within reach, Pep Guardiola's Manchester City are unstoppable today, but it wasn't always so. Time was when City mostly squirmed in the shadow cast by Manchester United. Occasionally, they stepped out of that shadow. In the late 1960s and the early 1970s, they were helped onto centre stage by the coaching duo of Joe Mercer and Malcolm Allison. This is their and City's fantastic story. Welcome to The Luke Alfred Show. I have 30 years of experience on the front lines of sports journalism, covering some of the biggest games in cricket, rugby, the FIFA World Cup, and even the Olympic Games. Come and join me as we learn about some of the greatest sports stories you've never heard. I'm Luke Alfred, and welcome to the show. Once upon a time, it was possible for football coaches to work together. This didn't happen often, to be sure, but it happened often enough for it to be deemed possible. The most obvious example dates back from the 1970s and concerns Brian Clough and Peter Taylor. The two played at Middlesbrough together and they formed a managerial partnership later at Derby County, Brighton and Hove Albion and Nottingham Forest. If I remember correctly, there is a passage in Duncan Hamilton's excellent biography of Clough, Provided You Don't Kiss Me, 20 years with Brian Clough, in which Taylor and Clough, after six successful but turbulent years at County, have a tiff over whether they will both leave Brighton for a better offer at Leeds United. Taylor says that Brighton have been loyal to the two of them and wants to stay. He has a stubborn streak. He was a goalkeeper. While Clough disagrees, telling Taylor that the Leeds offer is too big to ignore. They talk and Clough leaves in a strop. Soon he realises the error of his ways. Clough jumps in the car and drives from Nottingham to Brighton to persuade Taylor to come with him to Leeds. He becomes so desperate that he gets down on his hands and knees, a proposal of sorts, and pleads with Taylor. Coaching way back when was a form of marriage. Quote, I cannot be a manager without Peter Taylor, Clough said of his long-suffering partner. He knew Taylor softened all his rough edges and made his bewildering mood swings more bearable for others. Nowadays, coaches walk alone, the hired guns of the modern game. Can you imagine Jose Mourinho working with Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola sharing the stage with Carlo Ancelotti? How long could Antonio Conte spend on the dance floor with Mikel Arteta or Thomas Tuchel? Not long, I'm guessing. In this age where Manchester City can do no wrong, there is another coaching combination to hand, one that predates the Clough-Taylor partnership. It concerns Joe Mercer and his assistant, Malcolm Allison, and their role at Manchester City in the late 1960s. It was a partnership that worked, at least for a couple of giddy seasons, and partly came about because each man was plagued by ill health. While working as manager of Aston Villa in the mid-1960s, Mercer had a stroke. Some have written that it was a nervous breakdown. Whatever it really was, the Villa board waited patiently for his heart to recover, and when it had, promptly broke it again by sacking him. In Mercer's six years at Aston Villa, in which they shuttled like a bobbin on a loom between the first and the second divisions, Mercer assembled a talented side. English lovers of the game sat up and took notice. There was even a nickname given to the Villa side of the vintage, the Mercer Miners, which suggests they grabbed the public's imagination because nicknames are invariably a form of love. Although his health was dodgy and he had no job, Mercer had a reputation – the Manchester City board realised this and offered him a contract. This was Mercer's lifeline. City were in Division 2 when Mercer accepted in July 1965 and, as the saying goes, could only go up. This isn't entirely true. They could also go down, into the perpetual limbo of Division 3, although Mercer, a man with unfinished business after his spell at Villa, wasn't thinking about that just now. Shortly after he was offered the Manchester City job, Mercer looked at his portfolio. What stocks and options did he have? What could he cash in? Although he'd recovered from his stroke, he still wasn't an entirely well man. He could do with a new heart, but failing that, 
he'd settle for some new blood. This was achieved in part thanks to his recruitment of Allison. Allison, or Big Mal as he was sometimes called, had tuberculosis as a player. As extreme as it sounds today, he lost a lung because of it, and that was the end of his football career. It's a great headline, isn't it? Heartless boss recruits lungless wonder. Despite only having one lung, Allison smoked big cigars. He dressed with panache, sometimes his buttons undone to his navel, and was frequently seen in his trademark fedora hat. He prided himself on his forthright opinions. He later became famous for having an in-studio altercation with the Fulham in England player Alan Mullery, whom he accused of not being good enough for the international game. Television replayed the spat again and again. The punters loved it. Allison was a vain, audacious and casually impertinent man, puffing away at his cigar while others spoke. He once famously said of a former teammate and later a coaching rival, John Bond, quote, that Bond has blackened my name with his insinuations about the private lives of football managers. Both my wives are upset. Mercer knew that Allison would be the perfect foil for him and his dodgy ticker. He set about recruiting him. Big Mal was from the East End of London. He first played for Charlton Athletic, then West Ham. When it became clear he couldn't play professional football with one lung, he drifted. He became a used car salesman, dabbled in gambling, and this is almost absurdly predictable, briefly owned a nightclub in Soho's Tin Pan Alley. But football always held an attraction and he gravitated back to West Ham where he was instrumental in nurturing a young Bobby Moore. Moore later said that no one saw much in him at the time, but Allison became a mentor and helped him through the tricky phase of his early career. Had it not been for Allison, Moore might never have played 108 times for England, winning the World Cup with them in 1966. After working with Moore at West Ham, Allison moved on to coaching in his own right, coaching at Cambridge University in Bath City, where he was moderately successful. His time at Bath alerted other clubs, including Plymouth Argyle, and it was at Argyle where Mercer found him, the two having attended coaching courses at England's FA's coaching centre Lillishall together. One of the first things the emerging mercer Allison partnership at Manchester City did was to recruit a player called Book, a bricklayer rather than a librarian by trade since he'd met him at Bath. Later he offered Book a contract at Plymouth Argyle, but added that Book was approaching 30 and he wasn't exactly the kind of player some of the Argyle board were looking for. To sweeten the deal, he conspired to forge Book's birth certificate to make him appear younger than he was. Once Malcolm Allison was at Manchester City, one of the first things he did was to open the book on Book and sign him again. Mercer was having none of it. Book was too old, he complained, and the asking price of £17,000 was far more than he'd expected. He was hardly a bargain book. What were Argyle thinking? Eventually, though, Allison had his way, and he was pleased he did. Mercer was probably pleased too, because before long, Book had taken over the Manchester City captaincy from Johnny Crossan, who was injury-prone and eventually sold. In the 1965-66 season, Mercer and Allison's first in charge, City won the second division by five points over Southampton. They were promoted to the first division, the equivalent of the Premiership today. The following season in the first was neither moderately successful nor moderately unsuccessful. City finished 15th, their 42 matches netting 39 points. They were some way off relegation, but they were also some way off the pace. Unbeaten at home all season, Manchester United won the title by four points from second place Nottingham Forest. Across the city, City were not the happiest of campers, but neither were they without future plans. They had some gifted players in their midst, Colin Bell, Mike Summerby, Neil Young, Book the Bricklayer. This was not a team of slouches. Mercer and Allison made some more changes, 
most notably at goalkeeper, and felt it with a bit of luck it might just be City's season. Still, Big Brother United loomed, with players like Nobby Stiles, Brian Kidd, Bobby Charlton, George Best and Dennis Law to hand, they were a formidable proposition. City started the 1967-68 season in August, with a goalless draw at home to Liverpool. Away losses to Southampton and Stoke City followed, before City beat Southampton back at Main Road to record their first win of the season. Through September, City won four on the trot, including a 5-2 win against Sheffield United, before losing three consecutive matches to Arsenal, Manchester United, oh them again, and Sunderland respectively. After 11 matches, their season was looking suspiciously like a repeat in miniature of the season before. They'd won five, lost five, and drawn one. They were in the middle of nowhere, and they were also in the middle of the league. Yet Mercer and Allison weren't overly perturbed. They'd been looking for a striker and thought they'd found one after the loss to Sunderland at Roca Park in Game 11. His name was Francis Lee, and when City had won the second division in 1965-6, Lee had played against them for Bolton Wanderers, and he'd made a nuisance of himself. Allison and Mercer approached Lee with an interesting spiel. Quote, We've got a decent side at City, Mercer was reputed to have told Lee, but we are missing one crucial ingredient. We feel that you're it. Lee, later to become a millionaire through his sale of toilet rolls, made his City debut in mid-October in a 2-0 home win against Wolverhampton Wanderers. A week later, he was on the score sheet in a 4-2 away victory over Fulham at Craven Cottage. So began City's hot early season run. Between the win against Wolves, Lee's City debut in other words in mid-October, and a narrow loss to West Bromwich Albion two months later, Manchester City played 11 matches. They won eight of them and they drew the other three. Lee scored eight goals. Under Joe Mercer and Big Mal, Manchester City were beginning to leave accusations of being neither here nor there well and truly behind. At this point in the story, I find myself wondering about Mercer and Allison's working relationship. Mercer was born in 1914, while Allison was born in 1927, which made Mercer 13 years Allison's senior. Given their age difference, there must have been a father and son element to their relationship. Mercer had seen a bit of life by the time they met. His dad, Joe Senior, died of complications resulting from a German gas attack during the First World War, when Joe Jr. was 12 years old. During the Second World War, Mercer, by now having already officially played for England pre-war, was accused of dragging his heels when playing a wartime international. In actual fact, he had badly injured knee ligaments, so was dragging more than simply his heels. Everton, his club at the time, refused to pay for his surgery, so Mercer paid for it himself. Allison might have deferred to Mercer, but he wouldn't always have done so. He was too large a personality for that. His love for the game was legendary. He obsessed about it, and he was always looking for ways to make his teams better. The story is told that he found himself on national service in post-war Austria in 1948. He heard that the Red Army team were in Vienna, training on a pitch in the Prater Woods on the banks of the Danube. He went to watch them. Although wearing big boots, the Red Army team were passing the ball around with a kind of easy charm that left Allison spellbound. He returned to London at the end of his stint and promptly told his gaffer at Charlton Athletic that the kind of football Charlton were playing was absolute crap. In the middle of their 11-match run, City played Tottenham Hotspur at home on the 9th of December. It snowed beforehand and a blanket of snow covered the main road ground as the teams ran on. We know this because the match was televised on BBC's Match of the Day, the only City game that season to be shown on national television. Off in the far distance were long-suffering City and Spurs fans in the stands, a black, freezing mass. The teams ran on gingerly, not wanting to trip or slide. 
It was almost comic, so bad were the conditions. Spurs' Jimmy Greed scored the first goal of the match, a classically cheeky bit of opportunism. Greaves's goal prodded City into action, Bell, their elegant midfielder, equalising before half-time. Snow slanted down during the match itself, but this seemed to be of no matter to City, who screwed long studs into their boots on Book's advice. They scored three unanswered goals after the break through Tony Coleman, Summerby and Young to run out 4-1 winners. Well, it was more that they jogged or half ran out 4-1 winners. Conditions were nigh impossible. When the pitch wasn't covered in snow, it was muddy. Throughout, City played like princes, never deviating from their use of wide men or their passing game. Allison, we don't actually know this, might have been reminded of his encounter with the Red Army team in the Prater Woods in Vienna back in 1948. The win came to be known as the Ballet on Ice, as City suggested themselves as title contenders. In their next match, they drew 1-1 with Liverpool at Anfield, Lee getting the goal. He had slotted in easily. Mercer was right. He was just what City needed. It was going to be an exciting second half of the season. Slightly inexplicable home and away defeat to West Bromwich Albion before and after Christmas brought City down to earth, but they opened the new year with a 3-0 away victory over Nottingham Forest. It was the beginning of a seven-match unbeaten streak, the only draw coming against Arsenal at Main Road in early February. The City bubble was burst by Leeds United, who beat them 2-0 at Elland Road in March. It was not a happy day. Like City, Leeds were title contenders. City had already lost a fourth-round FA Cup replay to Leicester City by that stage, so the league was all they had. Dickie Hart and Wan Lung must have had some serious conversations. The Leeds defeat was bad enough, but four days afterwards City were scheduled to play their old rivals Manchester United, who had gone top thanks to City's defeat at Ellen Road. United, remember, had won the league the previous season and were in contention for the league again. City had already lost once to them that season. This match was at Old Trafford. It was now or never. A Rubicon moment. In front of 63,004 fans at Old Trafford, United took an early lead. City equalised and scored two more, one of them to Lee, as they romped to a 3-1 victory over Manchester United. City had nine matches left, battling it out with their nearest contenders, United, Liverpool and Leeds, for the title. Four of them were played in ten days at the beginning of April, two at home, two away. City won their home matches against Chelsea and West Ham, but lost to Leicester City at Filbert Street and Chelsea at Stamford Bridge. Nerves were hardly settled with a nil-nil draw against Wolves, but breathing for Mercer became slightly easier when, in City's fourth-last game of the season, they scrambled a vital home win against Sheffield Wednesday thanks to an own goal. The permutations were complicated to rehearse here, but should they win their last three fixtures, chances were that they'd win the title. West Bromwich, who had beaten City twice on either side of Christmas, clearly had a liking for crashing a party, because when City were eking out two points against Wednesday, West Bromwich Albion beat Manchester United. In City's third last game of the season, they played Everton. Book, the man whose age had been falsified by Allison when bringing him from Bath to Plymouth Argyle, scored a rare goal against the Toffees, Coleman getting the other in a 2-0 win. One down, two to go. In their penultimate game of the season against Spurs, their opponents in Ballet on Ice, City won 3-1. As the saying goes, they had one hand on the league trophy. Their last game of the season was against Newcastle United at St. James Park. Going into it, they were on the same number of points as Manchester United, but they had a better goal average, which is what counted in those days. In the event of both teams winning their final games of the season, City would take the title. As it was, they made exceptionally heavy weather of it in Newcastle. At half-time, the score was 2-all, United having twice come from behind to equalise. 
Young scored for City to make it 3-2 and then, appropriately, given that he had been dubbed the last piece of the jigsaw, Lee made it 4-2 to the visitors. Newcastle grabbed one back but it ended 4-3. With Sunderland beating Manchester United 2-1 in United's final game of the season, City were champions by two points over United and three over Liverpool, with Leeds finishing fourth, five points adrift. With 86 goals for and 43 goals against, Manchester City had a goal average of two, the best in the league. A league title had taken a while for Mercer. He would turn 54 a couple of months after the victory. After his struggles with his heart and his apprenticeship with the Morris Miners, it was the sweetest victory. Beside him, Allison was equally delighted. He had just turned 40. The football wheel turns in difficult to foresee ways. The following season, Manchester City could only watch as the side who had finished second in the league the previous season, Manchester United in other words, had a splendid European Cup run, while they faltered to Turkey's Fenerbahce, 2-1 on aggregate in the opening round. They did, however, manage to make up for their FA Cup disappointments of the previous season, playing in that year's FA Cup final against Leicester, the team who'd knocked them out in a fourth-round replay the year before. In Leicester's goals that day was a 16-year-old called Peter Shilton, a keeper who was to make as big an impression on the 1970s as the goalkeeper Gordon Banks had made on the 1960s. As it was, Shilton could do nothing against Young's left foot shot in the 23rd minute after a strong run by Summerby on the wing. Young's goal was the only goal of the game, as City took the 1969 FA Cup for the first time since their 1955-56 win against Birmingham City. There's a fun postscript to the story of Mercer and Allison's partnership. In time, Allison got Mercer's job, the job he had always wanted, with Mercer shuffling off upstairs. After wanderings elsewhere, Allison found himself back at City in 1979. By late 1980, however, it all began to go south for Allison in Manchester City. Sailing dangerously close to the bottom of the league, he was sacked by City chairman Peter Swales. In a perverse twist of fate, who should replace him but John Bond, manager of Norwich City and the man Allison accused of making insinuations about his private life years before. What does a sacked manager do? He goes back to his power base, where his contacts are and in this case it meant going back to London for Allison. He became coach at Crystal Palace for the second time. In a charming irony, Palace were drawn against Bond's Manchester City in that year's FA Cup third round. Given that there had been some bickering in the press between Bond and Allison, there was some nice sharp needle going into the tie. It was an away one for Palace, and so meant a trip to the very Manchester environment Allison knew so well, and had just left behind. Allison wanted desperately to win it, but was also desperate not to look too desperate. There's nothing as desperate as excessive desperation as we know. Bond City had the better side, but maybe Allison could just manage to fluke a win. This was a cup tie after all, a place where, traditionally, anything can happen and it frequently does. At half time it was nil nil, so Palace was still in with a shout. That's all it was, because they let in four goals after the break. Allison was a dejected man. So were the Palace players, their fans and the Palace board. Before long there was a Palace revolution. Allison hadn't been in the job for two months when he was shown the door. Worse still than losing his second job in two months, Allison could only stand idly by and watch Manchester City romp through the latter rounds of the FA Cup which rather reminds one of today. Some older listeners of this podcast might remember the final, City against the Spurs of Ozzy Ardiles, Ricky Villa and Glenn Hoddle. Worst of all, it was against a City side Allison had helped to make. The final between Spurs and Manchester City needed to go to a replay because the first one finished up one all after extra time. Five days later, Spurs won the replay 3-2. Allison could only watch and puff on his cigar, watching life pass him by. 
Later that decade, Ellison found himself at Sporting Lisbon. His goalkeeping coach had a son who used to come along to training. In time, that gangly teenage son would fill out. Some said he filled out so much that he became pretty full of himself. His name was Jose Mourinho. He would call Big Mal his inspiration in the years to come. If you enjoyed this episode of The Luke Alfred Show, please like, share, follow and subscribe. I write full scripts for the show in the form of long-form essays and these are all available on my Substack. To get written episodes of The Luke Alfred Show a day early on Fridays, please check out The Luke Alfred Substack. You can hear The Luke Alfred Show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I release a new episode every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. South African Standard Time.